Well, hello. Um, welcome to uh, Biology. Today we're going to talk about viruses. So you can print the note sheets out on Blackboard. So print those, you know, six slides per page. And I've left blanks in there for you to fill out as we go along so that you'll feel a little bit more engaged. I will be doing things like drawing or um, or things like that. So make sure you keep up with your uh, with your note slides. So today we're going to talk about viruses, and uh, these are very common structures. So you know, just take a second and think about what do you know about viruses? What experience do you have with viruses? So you can stop the video anytime I ask you what you think about things, and think about it, and then you can continue the uh, slideshow on. So just uh, a couple of things. Did you know this about viruses? Did you know that viruses can cause cancer. 15% of all human cancers that we've studied so far are actually caused by cancer. So did you know that 8% of your genome, that is the DNA that's inside your body, is actually viral DNA? Did you know that viruses may one day cure bacterial infections? So when our antibiotics uh, become ineffective one day, then uh, maybe we'll be using viruses that bacteria in order to cure our diseases. Um, viruses are sprayed on food already to stop food poisoning because these viruses have, can kill bacteria and bacteria causes us to be ill. It's actually sprayed on our food that you buy at the grocery store. There are trillions and trillions of viruses that are inside you right now. So they're very, very common, these little things called viruses. Maybe you've heard about jackalopes before in the past. So this is a mixture of a rabbit and an antelope. Yes, so are they actually real? What do you think? So they actually are real in the sense that uh, they don't look like this. This has been a taxidermied uh, rabbit with antlers added. But um, there is a virus that actually causes uh, rabbits uh, in some places in the country to actually sprout little horn-like structures out of its body. I just think that's kind of cool. So viruses can control behavior. I don't know if you knew that, but the gypsy moth caterpillar behavior can actually be altered by a virus. It actually infects the moth. It causes the caterpillar to go to the top of a tree and then explode, releasing viruses into the air, which is kind of cool. There are one billion viruses in a teaspoon of seawater, so ocean water. You've swam in that before, and you were swimming with billions and billions and billions of viruses. Viruses in the ocean kill of all bacteria every single day, which is just phenomenal to think about. Um, there are actually viruses that uh, parasitize other viruses, so that's kind of cool. And the mimivirus is the largest known virus, can be visible with a microscope. It contains about a thousand genes, and it's a, an absolutely huge virus. Most viruses, though, are not visible with uh, a regular microscope. And it could be said that all current organisms that are on Earth today are chimeric because uh, of uh, horizontal uh, gene transfer. So all viruses are mixtures of all other organisms because the viruses will carry DNA from one organism to another and incorporate themselves into those organisms. So just a few facts about viruses. Now viruses are really small. So if you look at this particular graphic here, this is an animal cell, this is a bacterium, and this is a virus. So you can see that they're really quite small compared to cells that you would associate with the, uh, with, uh, um, the human body. So I'm going to draw for a virus with you real quickly. Make sure that you uh, draw these things as we go through too so that you can practice uh, the things that you need to, uh, to know. So I'm just going to take and, uh, and sketch a little virus for you. Viruses have a very simple structure. They have, uh, all viruses have this in common. They have a protein coat that goes around the outside surface, and this is called the capsid. And then inside, they have some kind of genetic material. The genetic material can be DNA or RNA. So, but this would be a common structure that all viruses would, uh, would have. So you have an outer capsid protein layer, and then inside you have uh, genetic material of some kind. So that could be DNA or that could be uh, RNA, depending upon the type of virus that uh, you're looking at. So 
Um, most simple viruses only have a protein coat and they're surrounded that surrounds their DNA or RNA. And sometimes uh, viruses will contain enzymes, uh, little protein enzymes uh, with them. Uh, more complex viruses, though, have a viral envelope that surrounds the capsid. These viral envelopes are cell membranes from the host, and uh, they are kind of dangerous in the sense that they hide the, the virus from the host um, that they are actually infecting. So the host immune system can't see them since they're you know, surrounded by a cell membrane from the actual host. And uh, bacteriophages are a group of viruses with uh, very complex um, capsids, the, the protein coat. They have tail fibers and a head. They almost look like a lunar lander module. And uh, these will only infect bacteria. So these are just some different kinds of bacteria. Here you can see a tobacco mosaic virus that's located right here. Um, we have an adenovirus that's located right here. It's got a pretty complex shape in an outer protein layer. So this is the one of the most dangerous viruses right here. This is the flu virus, the influenza virus that hopefully you get a vaccine for each year. And then we have over here a bacteriophage. So notice how complex the structure looks. So viruses contain no organelles. They have no cell parts. They contain a few enzymes. Some of them do. They cannot reproduce without a host. They do not metabolize or eat food of any kind. They don't use water. They don't use gases. They um, uh, do have DNA. The DNA can be either um, double-stranded or single-stranded, or, or they may contain RNA that can be double-stranded or single-stranded. So it's, it's a, a big question, you know, are viruses living? Well, under our definition of what is living, living things are made of cells. And as you can see, these particular things called viruses do not contain cells. They're not made of cells. They don't contain cell parts or organelles. The only thing that makes them similar to living things is that they contain DNA or RNA, and uh, they reproduce, but they can only reproduce with a host. So many scientists believe that these things are non-living. They're considered to be infectious particles and not truly living organisms. So how does a virus reproduce? Well, viruses will attach to the host cell. So they'll come in and they'll come in and uh, attach to the membrane of the cell. The membrane will bring them in and then they'll break into individual components, as you can see over here. So they enter, they will uh, replicate their DNA or RNA, so make copies of their DNA or RNA. This DNA or RNA will be transcribed in, by the ribosomes into messenger RNA or into other kinds of RNA. This RNA will be coded into proteins. Some of the viral RNA will just be uh, replicated and, uh, and these things will come together and they will assemble and then they will exit the host to infect other um, cells. Now when they inf uh, release, re um, release from the host, they typically kill the host and, uh, and that's why viruses can be very dangerous. They kill uh, host cells. The host provides all kinds of things. They provide DNA and RNA polymerases, the, the, the actual proteins that will make DNA or RNA. They uh, will provide the ribosomes. They provide building materials, and they provide ATP for uh, the energy to build these things um, that are called viruses. Now, a bacteriophage works a little differently. A bacteriophage can have two different cycles. It can have a lytic cycle, which is where the virus enters, kills, it reproduces, and then kills the, the host cell. Or it can have a lysogenic cycle, where it uh, actually enters and um, the, the bacteria. It will then integrate itself into the bacterial chromosome. It'll become a prophage. The prophage may stay for a period of time, or it may uh, exit the bacteria and enter into a lytic cycle. And if it uh, exits, the lytic cycle will, will, uh, will um, happen. So here you can see a uh, virus uh, that is entering into a cell. Now it has two choices. It can either go into a lytic cycle and kill the host cell, or it can enter into the lysogenic cycle incorporate itself as a prophage into the 
into the bacterium. Every time the bacterium reproduces, the prophage bacteria, um, the prophage virus DNA also replicates. And, um, and you know, so that's kind of neat. And, uh, and then sometimes the, the, the cell will, uh, will uh, begin to, if the virus wants to exit, go into a lytic phase, and then the viruses will exit out of the host cell. So taking, know what you, taking what you know about viruses, do you think viruses are living or non-living? So what do you think? So maybe stop the recording and think about that for a second, but uh, you need to make a, a, you know, an argument for that, especially when you go to taking the test. So the argument against viruses being considered living things, uh, viruses do not make or use energy. Viruses lack any way to metabolize carbon or use carbon in any way. They do not replicate. So viruses are replicated by cells. They do not evolve. They are evolved by cells. But, um, but they don't evolve themselves. Not a single gene is shared by all viruses. Viruses uh, do not have membranes and therefore they don't have membrane heredity. So every cell in your body, every cell came from pre-existing cells. So that membrane of the original cell is retained in the cells that are formed. Viruses do not transmit any part of themselves to the next generation uh, except for coded information. So these are reasons why viruses are not considered to be living. One other thing is that if we seeded a sterile planet that had all physical and chemical requirements that are needed to host life with all viruses that have ever been known on Earth, nothing would actually happen. So there would just be a progressive decay of the molecules composing those viruses. They can't live without hosts. So in 2000, viruses were officially considered to be um, not alive by the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. So it's a pretty good argument that they're not considered to be living. Some people in the virus field, though, want to divide all living things into two groups. They do want to divide uh, all living things into uh, capsid encoding organisms, which would be all of your viruses, uh, or ribosome encoding organisms, which would be all the other living things. But this hasn't had, this does not have widespread approval by uh, people in the field. So if viruses are considered to be non-living infectious particles, how do we create drugs to destroy them? Well, you know, that's a very difficult thing. So um, do antibiotics work uh, or to destroy viruses? How do antibiotics work? So let me go back and, and talk about that. So we created these things called antibiotics, or stole them from nature, um, to destroy bacteria. Bacteria have cell parts, and antibiotics actually work to deactivate cell parts. So if you use an antibiotic, that's used for bacteria. Since viruses do not have cell parts, then they don't have ways that antibiotics can actually work against them. So if you're infected with a virus and you take an antibiotic, that's not going to destroy the virus. Only antibiotics will destroy bacteria. There are a few antiviral drugs, but um, they don't destroy cell parts. They help to deactivate certain enzymes from working and, and to disrupt the viral replication. So there are all different kinds of viruses. I don't expect you to know this whole chart, but you can take a look to see that there's all different kinds of viruses that are, are out there. Some viruses are double-stranded DNA, some are single-stranded DNA, some are double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA. So different kinds of viruses. Um, on the blackboard, I put this video for you to look at. So I want you to take a look at that. And uh, this is, talks about zoonotic viruses, which are very dangerous viruses that infect uh, animals. So take a look at that and see uh, what you think. There is a whole host of viruses out there. There are different kinds of viruses that infect animals. Viruses are typically specific. You know, not all viruses infect all living things, but animal viruses will infect animals. So one of the most dangerous uh, viruses that have been out there is the smallpox virus. And you can see that on this child here, smallpox actually causes these little pox to form, which can then get infected with bacteria. This particular virus has been eradicated for the most part. It only exists in the freezers of, um, of governments. Uh, the United States has some, Russia has some, and you do have small outbreaks of small, smallpox periodically. The measles uh, virus is making a comeback because people are not having their children vaccinated. 
you know, if you're in public schools, then uh, you had to be vaccinated. But uh, this is a deadly virus. Um, you know, the reason we get vaccinations is to protect people that don't have immune systems. So some people are, have children that are born without immune systems. And if we don't get vaccinated for these uh, viruses and protect the rest of the population, then those people with um, no immune systems will sub succumb to these viruses. So I definitely encourage you, if you have children or if you plan to have children one day, definitely get them vaccinated. You're going to save their life because this is a killer. It's still killing people today, but it's completely, um, you know, you can have a vaccine and completely make sure that yourself or your loved ones don't uh, acquire this particular disease. The herpes virus is very common. It's spread from, you know, contact with uh, infected uh, sores. And uh, so, and uh, polio is still out there as well. Um, polio still is acquired by people today because uh, they don't get the, uh, the vaccine. So make sure that you uh, get uh, your children vaccinated for this particular organism. This is the hepatitis virus. The hepatitis virus is, uh, is uh, a disease that can cause liver damage. Um, most of you had hepatitis B vaccine, but you can have uh, a, um, you can acquire other kinds of hepatitis, hepatitis A and hepatitis C. So they're very common uh, viruses. So make sure you protect yourself from anything that's uh, blood. Blood. Uh, this is a bloodborne pathogen that you can acquire by uh, touching tainted blood. So this is the influenza uh, virus, and uh, you know this is a killer of millions and millions of people. Maybe this is the most dangerous virus that's ever existed. So um, some emerging uh, viral infections would include Ebola. Ebola is uh, is a, a very deadly bloodborne pathogen. We had an outbreak of it several years ago in Africa, and uh, it uh, causes a liquefaction of the human body. So what it does is it comes in, the virus destroys, uh, you know, your uh, cells that line your blood vessels, and the blood vessels start to leak. So you leak blood from all the uh, places in your body. Hantavirus is carried by the um, by um, rats or mice rodents and uh, they uh, basically rodents get into your house they urinate the urine becomes dry the virus becomes is in the urine and when the urine becomes dry it becomes in a powder form that can get into the air and infect your lungs this is a pretty big killer of people though several other viruses that are relatively new uh, this is the SARS virus that was uh, originally found in China and the MERS virus which is a virus a respiratory virus found in the middle originally found in the Middle East these uh, have outbreaks periodically and these are respiratory viruses probably the virus that's uh, <coughs> uh, very dangerous that uh, is in your mind is the HIV virus this is what the virus looks like I don't expect you to know every single thing about the virus but it is a very complex virus. It does have a viral envelope, which is this little membrane out here on the outside surface. There is a capsid on the inside that contains the viral RNA. So it has two little viral RNA molecules. And then it has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Um, this is a very deadly uh, virus. And this is what they look like down here if you were to look at them through an electron microscope. This is what I do expect you to know, though. I expect you to be able to draw and label a, an HIV virus. This will be found in your study guide, so make sure you take a look at that. Um, make sure you can draw the viral envelope. Make sure you can draw the capsid and that you have RNA and all the enzymes inside. So an HIV virus, when you're exposed to it, it actually will dock with uh, helper T cells. So it's a very specific kind of cell that it actually docks with and joins with. When the virus comes in, all of the particles are broken down. The viral RNA will be transcribed. So it uses reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme that comes with it. And it transcribes the RNA into DNA. Now, there are reverse transcriptase drugs that target this particular thing so that it can't make itself into DNA. The DNA will uh, lodge itself into the uh, host uh, cell's um, genome. It becomes a provirus. And uh, from there, it will make RNA molecules. Your, and then your uh, host cell will, uh, will make all of the proteins 
that it needs to assemble into fully functional viruses and then it exits the host cell to infect other cells. Now what makes this thing so dangerous is it, it destroys helper T cells and once your helper T cells are no longer uh, available then you can't, um, you can't fight infections. There's a little video here that you can watch um, if you uh, take a look at this on, um, if you take a look at the PowerPoint online. So um, I'll also try to put that online for you to look at. So again, the host cell provides everything. The virus docks with it. It tra transcribes itself into, into um, um, DNA that can be in, or incorporated into the host uh, genome. It then replicates itself. And, uh, and all the proteins that it needs and then exits the cell. And uh, so just so you'll copy things down and make sure you have complete notes. So the glycoprotein binds to a receptor on the cell membrane of a T cell. This allows the virus to fuse with the membrane. The HIV viral capsid breaks apart, releasing the RNA and reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase allows DNA to be copied into RNA. DNA is incorporated as a provirus into the cell's DNA. The provirus is transcribed into messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is translated into the viral proteins and viruses are assembled and eventually leave the cell. So HIV is going to reduce the number of active lymphocytes, which causes eventually the loss of the ability to produce antibodies. Now antibodies are disease-fighting chemicals that we use to destroy um, all kinds of things that invade our body. Eventually, this, uh, this loss of our immune system leads to AIDS, the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or a total collapse of the immune system. And this is why people with HIV, um, you know, they don't die from HIV virus directly, but because the HIV virus destroys the immune system, then they die from, um, from infections that com come into the human body. So just a thought question, why are RNA viruses, uh, RNA viruses more likely to mutate than DNA viruses? You may want to pause for a second and, uh, and think about that. Well, um, so let me just go ahead and tell you. So uh, RNA viruses are likely to mutate because when you take and convert RNA into DNA, um, that conversion process oftentimes will cause errors to be formed. So those errors are mutations, and therefore those mutations can lead to viruses that can be, you know, um, can be immune to um, uh, various kinds of drugs that we might use to them. So RNA viruses pretty hard to fight in regards to because they mutate so often. So just a couple statistics about HIV. There are two million new cases of HIV. Uh, there were two million cases of HIV in 2014. 36.9 million people are living with HIV around the world today. An estimated 1.2 million people died from AIDS-related illnesses in 2014. And since 2000, around 25.3 million people have died from AIDS-related illness. So this is a major killer of people. Unfortunately, it, it uh, affects people in Africa a little bit more. Sub-Saharan Africa, 66% um, of all new HIV cases are isolated to Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is really decimating in regards to the folks in, um, around the world, but especially in Africa. So if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, it's very, very affected. Um, you know, uh, Russia and the United States has high numbers of cases. There are some areas that don't report or under-report, uh, like North Korea, China. So we don't know exactly what's going on in certain locations. So, but this is a major killer of people all around, all around the world. Just think for a second, what are the social and cultural implications of viral diseases? So you can stop your computer and think about that for a second. You know, socially and culturally, viruses are really important. You know, in Africa, for example, you know, there are some villages where all the old people or older people have been killed by HIV virus. So you have whole societies where there's no adults to transmit cultural information to the young people. So, you know, viral outbreaks, you know, uh, happen. In Africa, uh, several years ago, the Ebola virus uh, broke out and it caused uh, uh, literally borders to close, airports to stop sending people around the world, uh, co economies collapsed, uh, food distribution stopped. It's, it can be very, very serious, um, these things called uh, viruses. 
Now we do have uh, this uh, phenomenon here recently of the emergence of new viruses and I just kind of jotted down a few ideas about why new viruses are emerging seemingly out of nowhere. So viruses have high rates of mutation. This means that new viruses will be uh, existing each year or will be evolved each year. Um, this is why you have to get a flu shot every year because viruses have a high rate of mutation. Now some viruses don't have a high rate of mutation like the measles or polio so you get that vaccine one time and it works uh, it works effectively for generally the rest of your life so um, viruses can spread from one host to another this allows for the emergence of viruses pretty easily there are great environmental changes occurring across the earth today so this can change um, you know where viruses existed and were isolated these can spread to new species and get into human population so when you take and you cut a, a road into a forest that's never been occupied by humans uh, for example, a rainforest, this can expose people to new viruses that have never been in human population before. Um, so we do have the ability to expand viruses. If the world is warming, viruses can, uh, that are carried by mosquitoes will have a wider range of availability of places where they can breed and grow and, and be transmitted. It's been pretty, pretty well documented that the hantavirus, um, which is carried in rodents, is linked to uh, weather phenomenon like El Nino. When the Pacific Ocean warms abnormally um, during certain times of the year in the Pacific, um, that can cause uh, more rainstorms to occur in other areas like deserts in the United States, and that causes more vegetation growth, which leads to more rodents, and then more rodents will be more likely to get into people's houses. Therefore, the spread of the virus is linked to environmental um, changes. And, uh, you know, we create new niches all the time. For example, you know, uh, for most of the human history, we didn't have blood transfusions, but now we do. And uh, viruses can be spread, uh, spread through blood transfusions. Uh, you can be in uh, a plane today and be in China tomorrow. And uh, so world travel is spreading viruses. Intravenous drug use, you know, the sharing of needles, uh, uh, changing sexual habits, unprotected sexual habits. Large populations of people, you know, spread viruses very easily. Public uh, restrooms, door handles, salad bars. Think about that next time you go to a salad bar and you touch the tongs of, you know, those tongs have been touched by hundreds of people and maybe, maybe somebody's had a, a viral infection that could spread to you. Of course, you know, when you open up a human body in surgery, you're introducing the ability of viruses to get in. Hospitals, last place I ever want to go is a hospital because that's where major viruses are being spread. You know, very ill people go to hospitals and a lot of times they have viral infections. And we do create uh, new viruses. Uh, you know, there are bioweapons programs and genetic engineering that can sometimes create uh, new viruses. There are other things other than viruses that uh, can actually cause disease. We have viruses uh, called, or, or little uh, smaller things called viroids and virusoids, which are basically just, uh, you know, pieces of uh, genetic material that are replicating themselves and going into, into humans and other organisms. Uh, we have RNA satellites and transposons and plasmids. These are pieces of DNA that can uh, actually transmit uh, disease. Something that's kind of new is uh, prion. Prions are infectious proteins. And uh, I don't know if you ever heard of mad cow's disease, but um, there are cows that eat other cow materials that are infected with prions. And these uh, prions get in and they cause the, human, uh, the cow brain to actually be destroyed. So it causes them to go mad or to, to appear to be um, mad. Uh, prions alter normal proteins to become prion proteins, and if an animal eats another animal infected with prions, it can become infected. So people who have visited certain countries in Europe and ate red meat that might have been tainted with prions uh, cannot give blood. So um, there are human diseases, uh, the Kretschak's uh, Jacobs disease, uh, Kretzfeld Jacobs disease, excuse me, is a disease that, uh, that is transmitted from human to human, and it is a prion disease. And this is sometimes, so you don't want to be a cannibal because if you eat human brains that are infected with uh, these particular prions, then you would acquire that as well. 
So here's just a prion. It comes in and it alters normal proteins to be prion proteins and it just keeps on replicating until your whole brain is nothing but prion proteins and uh, that's not good for the human brain. Um, I do encourage you, if you like viruses, to read a couple of books. Uh, there is a book called uh, The Planet of Viruses. This is a relatively simple read, and uh, it talks about all kinds of things related to viruses. If you want a really complex read, you can read Spillover. This is one of the biggest books I've ever read, but it's a very complete uh, book on um, animal infections or zoonotic infections. So I encourage you to read those. And uh, there's a really good website. Uh, the CDC has a website that has information on all different kinds of viral infections if you're just curious to want to know more. Well, that completes this particular uh, viral lecture. Remember, you're never alone. You can email other students. You can email me. You can go online. There is a discussion area where you can discuss anything that you want to. Um, so please make sure you don't feel alone. Make sure you do your study guide. Make sure you complete all of your activities that go along with this particular, um, with this particular um, topic. So we'll see you next time. Bye.